Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and this is Renata McNay. Hello. And we're here at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in, in Holland. And the Science and Non-Duality uh, Conference happens every year in, in Holland and also every year in California in October. They've been going for about four years in America now. And there's been, it's been wonderful, about 100 panelists and lots of great people. And so we have a panel now. And the, the name of the panel, and I read it out because I thought about it very carefully, is Now We Are Awake, Are We Going to Save the Planet? And we have three, of course, very awake people here. <laughs> we have Will Pye, and Will's written a book called Blessed with a Brain Tumor, Your Personal Wake-Up Call. Elizabeth Saturis, who is an author, evolutionary biologist and futurist, and she said I should call her a cosmic snoop, but that's, um, <laughs> I guess that's off the record. <laughs> and then Jeff Warren, who has a, written a book called The Head Trip, and he's also president of the Canadian, the, the Canadian Conscious Explorers Club, is that right? Consciousness Explorers Club, yeah. Okay, great. Self-proclaimed president. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. So I was going to start with you, Will, because you were telling me, I only met you about 15 minutes ago, you were telling me about your book, which sounds fascinating, and I think it's a great introduction to, to our panel. Sure. So the book is a, a first-person narrative of my experience of being diagnosed with a brain tumor and experiencing it not only with a, an absence of stress and suffering, but with an abundance of joy, uh, wonder, and indeed great opportunity for psychospiritual growth. So uh, it then goes on to explore how one might approach life, whether it be a rude customer service or a life-threatening illness, in such a way as to extract the gift and the opportunity. And there's a meta-narrative working through which is suggestive of how this microcosm, this little personal experience, is offering a clue perhaps as to how we might approach our collective crises challenges and see that in fact they are opportunities, invitations for us to wake up and know ourselves in a deeper and more true way. Okay, and, and your health is good now? Everything is? My health is perfect as I experience it. MRI scans are another matter altogether, but uh, my, my health is experienced in, in, in perfect uh, exuberant vitality. And that's what I feel when I'm looking at you, this vibrant uh, vibrantness coming, coming over, which is wonderful, yeah. Let, just tell me a little bit about your work, because you were telling us a fascinating story last night about how you had this meeting coming up with some very important people. <laughs> well, as in, uh, the reason I'm an evolution biologist is because I, I always wanted to know uh, who are we people and where do we come from and where we're headed. So I also wanted to be a futurist. And it seemed to me that evolution biology gave you the opportunity to study the deep past. And if you know the trajectory from which you've come, you have a better chance of seeing where you can go in the future. Okay. Good. And Jeff, tell me a little bit more about what you do in terms of the, the club you're the self-proclaimed president of, and a little bit about your life. Just right. <coughs> Pardon me. So I'm a journalist. I mean, that's my main preoccupation uh, and occupation. And I've been a writer for most of my adult life. I used to work for the CBC in Canada, and I wrote a book called Head Trip, which was all about the neurobiology of waking, sleeping, and dreaming, trying to understand how these states of consciousness relate to each other. And through that, through writing that book, I ended up, uh, I wrote a chapter on pure consciousness, and I started a practice myself, and this is a, almost 10 years ago now. And the more I practiced, the more uh, it became no longer just a sort of journalistic pursuit, and became something that started to really affect my life and to change my life. Um, and that's what I've been working on now is a big book about that. But over the course of doing that, I was encouraged by some of my teachers to start teaching meditation. Uh, and it sort of took off that part of my life. I teach sort of introductory meditation to folks. And through that, I started something called the Consciousness Explorers Club. And the idea was to bring a sort of playful, um, open-minded attitude to exploring how the mind works um, and it, there's sort of three pieces to that. The first part is going in. We say me, it was about meditation or any kind of spiritual practice, like understanding what's happening and approaching it in a um, not in a sort of dour or fundamentalist way, but more in an open, uh, secular-friendly, uh, playful way. 
And then, so we say that's meditate, and then we have the celebrate. So that's kind of making it fun. We have dance parties and just generally having an attitude of levity around it because there's such a, there can be such a dourness in, uh, in some spiritual scenes. But then the last part that relates to this, I mean, I guess it all relates to it, but is the activate piece. Um, and the idea there is that, you know, you start to work on yourself, you start to um, practice in different ways, starts to create certain kinds of openings, uh, gives you more equanimity around a, a capacity to stand in the middle of your life's challenges. And it also opens up, uh, it, it gives you more of a desire to kind of, at least it did for me, to kind of give back in some way. So the idea behind the activate piece is how to support people in their interests, in their social justice interests, in their environmental interests. And, and there's a lot I could say about that piece. Uh, um, and just let me know when you want me to say it, because I don't have to say it now. Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in there because I saw this film about four or five years ago um, and it was a film about the environment and about the planet and about how important it was that we act. And it was, it was, I, I liked the film and it was, so, it was funded by this crowdsource method where people put in a little bit of money and they got the money together and they did it on a shoestring. It was well done. I can't remember the name of the film, unfortunately. And they had a series of premieres in different cinemas in the UK, and I went to one of these premieres. And where I was, where I thought something was lacking was it was all about change on the outside. And they said, we have to get the governments to listen. We have to get something to change there. And nobody was talking about, well, what's happening here? And can we get change there of any substance and value without recognizing that maybe something's not balanced there and this kind of eternal thing we try and find the happiness and fix it there and actually the root is here and as I think most of us know and it's been reinforced the last few days the root is actually the ground of being whatever we call it oneness Consciousness doesn't matter. It's here. And I think in your own way, you've all had, you've all kind of got that and you're all living from that space. So, I don't know. Can I, can I say why I am here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not only here because I'm part of Conscious TV, um, because I, I'm also here because I'm deeply interested in that subject uh, through an experience I had um, a few, a couple of months ago, I went to a lecture and um, with a Sufi master, Luellen Wan Lee, and he said, he told the story that um, Thich Nhat Hanh, I assume a lot of people here know who Thich Nhat Hanh is, he was asked, by one of his students, tell me, what can we do for the planet? And the answer was um, from Thich Nhat Hanh, listen to the earth cry. And when I heard that, it was also, I know the struggle of the earth, it was such a deep shock into my system, it was like, for the first time I came, I became completely connected with this body because I realized this body is part of our earth. And um, I looked at um, where, where I'm not aware with my body, in my body, how much is the knowledge I know you know, we all are looking for enlightenment. We all want to transcend more into the absolute than embodying and uh, confronting the suffering and um, the kind of messiness on our planet. And, um, well, that set me on a journey with my own body in connection to the earth because I felt only when I really hear the cry in my own body, I can hear the cry of the earth, and only then I know what to do. 
So that's why I'm here. Here at this Science and Non-Duality Conference, we've been talking a lot about non-duality, about oneness. And uh, when we uh, talk about um, the Earth as something separate from us, or the word environment, it's something separate from us. So I like to use ecosystems instead of environment. And um, we've been hearing so much about how there really is no boundary between ourselves and everything else in this universe, that it's not an outside that we have to change, um, or just an inside that we have to change, because there is no inside and outside, except as a complementarity that's no more separated than hot and cold. It's a continuum. Um, up and down, all of those things. In indigenous cultures, they don't have this sense that there's an inner to work on and an outer world to work on, and that they're different. So if we see all this, um, as, for instance, Bernardo Castrop talked last uh, uh, yesterday in his talk about the brain being a self-localized piece of matter within cosmic mind, and then all of the brains are whirlpools within this mind. And my own favorite metaphor is the universe as a keyboard and ourselves as a keyboard, where matter is the low frequencies and electromagnetic energy is a higher frequency as you moved up. Einstein showed us, of course, that those are the same thing. And as you go up the keyboard, you get into consciousness and spirit and mind and all those words that we use for the non-material. So the matter is like waves in the ocean, you know, we see them as entities, and so are our brains, and so are we. And so when we're talking about what's happening on the planet and what can we do for the planet, we need to have that connection. So this makes me think of my guru, J. Allen Boone, whose uh, uh, easily available book is Kinship with All Life. He was known as uh, St. Francis of Hollywood, and it was a dog, the first movie star dog in Hollywood, Strongheart, who taught him communion. Communion instead of communication. We humans in our separateness have developed language and we talk about communicating with each other. We use gesture language and words and write it all down and save it and re broadcast it and things like that. But everything in nature is in communion with everything else, including the cells of my body. They wouldn't function if they didn't all know what each other were doing, a hundred trillion of them, uh, complex uh, cities. So we, we have to uh, get back this birthright that we have to commune the way everything in nature does so that we are aware of the of the total interconnectedness, the oneness of it. So it makes me think of the time, uh, first time I went into the Amazon with a beautiful long-haired Indian, and I was naive enough to say, can you teach me how to talk to the plants and animals? And he said, oh, shut up, Elizabeth, and listen. <laughs> he said, this conversation of the forest has been going on as long as there's been a forest. Your job isn't to initiate it, it's to hear it, and then join in. There's actually different, uh, when you look at the brain, there are different networks. There's a, there are egocentric networks that are about projecting outward, and there are sort of allocentric networks that are about receiving. So it really is a lot about learning to listen. Um, but bother, I mean, that's a practice. You know, it's people, we're constantly rushing forward in a particular kind of way, and part of what practice teaches you is to take a moment to pause and to actually receive and to see what someone is saying or what's being, what, what's coming in. Um, it's curious you mentioned the desire to transcend and often this is emphasized within spiritual circles and yet for me there's a real obviousness and clarity that when we awake to the experience that we are one, when it becomes something other than an intellectual understanding, when we realize that this is in fact just one, of course we act in ways that are respectful, that are aware of, that are supportive of that environment. And so I would question the depth of an awakening that does not have some form of conscious embodiment, that does not have some form, not necessarily of getting out there with a placard, but some way of healing the planet, which is uh, 
desperately seeking that healing, as you mentioned, Renata. Yeah, we have kind of lost this... Um, I see it as a kind of a flow. I remember the opening talk by Lotus Schaefer and then John Hagelin, I think, the next day. It's kind of... There is somehow an order in everything. We, and we kind of, we've kind of lost... We've got caught up here yeah. as a human race and we've lost our sense of flow, correctness and order, and we've become these separate beings, or we think we are these separate beings. The, the writer David Abram talks a lot about um, uh, reciprocity, this notion of uh, that you're actually embedded in these reciprocal relationships with not just all the human beings that are around you, but with the natural world in general. But that if you don't cultivate that acknowledgement or that sensibility, then you're not going to feel it. And I think that's sort of what ends up happening is we're s so many people are so preoccupied in their own lives, their own concerns, they're just spinning around that they don't uh, cultivate that, that sensitivity to notice that there's other things going on. And then you don't, then all of a sudden you're cut off from the feedback loops of the planet when the planet is screaming out and there's really obvious things that are happening and you don't feel it the way you might if you were much more closely embedded into the ecosystem. Now, I mean, the thing is everyone is beginning to feel it now. I mean, it, it's out there. People realize there's, that there's work to be done. And how did you start to feel it? Mm -hmm. You know, we've heard Will's story here about how the catalyst for him. What was the catalyst for your, your change in understanding? Well, I, I mean, I guess, I think, I feel like it's important to say that my understanding is that awakening is something that happens along a, along a continuum. And I consider myself very much in the shallow end of the continuum. Basically, I've got like water wings on. Like, I, maybe these guys are far more deeply uh, along than me or more evolved, but I like the fact that I'm in the shallow end of the continuum. You know, because it makes, it's not like you have to wait till you're enlightened before you're going to actually begin to try to do something. You have to try to do something right now, and, you, and, and that includes both what you're doing externally, but also working on yourself. And so the way I see it is, uh, the best description for me of how that works is from a, a teacher named Shin Zen Young, who's been really influential for me. And he talks about something he calls waxy buildup. And he, and he talks about how most relationships... Um, you know, something happens and someone does something that kind of maybe irritates you just a slight bit, but you're like, <clears throat> then you, you let it go. And but there's a little bit of waxy buildup there. And then, you know, you keep interacting and then someone said, they do the same thing, you know, four days later and it bugs you a little bit more and a little bugs you a little bit more. And after a while, that waxy buildup gets really big. And it's how you can go from being in a relationship where you really love somebody where all of a sudden you're just infuriated with them or you go instantly into divorce. And it, it's so the, the, the practice is equanimity. The practice is how to be with what's going on and not in a way that's reactive, in a way that, not in a way that creates that waxy buildup. So you can actually be genuinely present for what's happening in your life, for what people are telling you instead of just, just having that instant reaction. And that's something that you can cultivate any time in a practice from the moment you just begin to get interested in this. And it's something you take out into the world because it... If you're acting in a way in the world with, without that, you're much more efficient. There's all this energy being bound up in that reactivity. So that's, that's, how an inner, that's one of the ways in which an inner practice can support an outer practice. And for me, that's what kind of began to happen. I began to see uh, from a first-person perspective like how when I was more, brought more equanimity in my life, it started to change some of my relationships around me. It certainly activated more of a sense of wanting to, to, to do something in the world. That's why I started the, you know, the group that I did and interested in. And, but I've been mostly inspired just by my friends. I mean, I have lots of friends without any spiritual practice who are all involved in various social justice initiatives or environmental initiatives. So, I mean, I think it's like, yet yeah, they could really use a, an inner practice so they could be more efficient in the way that how they're helping. You, how have you felt the change? What's changed about you, do you feel? I just think more of an inner smoothness is what's changed. Okay. But it's been very, you know, for me, I don't feel that different than I ever did. You know, I don't, you know, the descriptions of oneness, of, of like a separate self falling away, those are not things that happen. Yeah, that but inner smoothness, that's... Yeah, yeah I, feel, so I feel like the inner Fonzarelli. It's <laughs> kind of good stuff. A little right? bit, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, a little bit of inner Fonzarelli. And I'm just more, I'm more sensitive, so I'm like more yeah. broken up by stuff. I get yeah. heartbreaking all the time by yeah. things. And I think that's... See, the orient of a practice is like expanding your bandwidth. Like you go down to the ground, you have a greater capacity to sort of be with what is, but you also go out into this greater sensitivity where you're like, ugh, you know, you're just gutted by stuff more. And I feel like I can't ignore the suffering I see around me as much. I, I, I try to, I really try to sometimes because it's like really overwhelming. But I, you don't really get a choice, you know, and that's something that people don't talk about so much in practice is that, that heartbreak quality that you're going to get busted down sometimes in a way.
And, okay. uh, I see you nodding, Will. Yeah. This is a juncture as well of where the, the inner practice and the outer change meet. Uh, as Elizabeth pointed, there's actually no distinction between the inner world and the outer world, but certainly it's a, a common experience that there is this me, inner, and the outer world. And when we're able to, to notice that the, uh, the greed or the self-serving nature we might see in a, or we might perceive in an executive of an oil company, or the, uh, the, the ignorance we might perceive elsewhere, the judgment, the anger, is in fact present in ourselves, we begin to uh, dissolve these aspects of our own experience. And where it gets really exciting from a perspective of a sacred activism, if, if you like, is you can meet someone else's anger. You can meet someone else's ju judgment. You can meet someone else's greed, their separation, their pain, their suffering. And in a moment of offering your loving presence, this loving presence, it's not my loving presence, it's not your loving presence, it's this loving presence, change happens. Mm. And if you can bring that level of presence or energy into activist work, into communication, as Gandhi said, if you have a message, you must give it with love, or else the message and the messenger will be ignored. Mm. So there's, there's such a powerful meeting of the activist approach, getting out there and doing things, but doing it from a place of knowing that it is just all perfection unfolding. That's There's no problem here. The great Gita line, not being attached to the fruit of your actions. So I was interested um, to hear from you, Will, after you had the diagnosis that you had brain tumor, how did, how did it came about that you started to feel this joy or this curiosity or this well-being? How, how, how was this transformation? How did you overcome your fear of maybe losing it on different levels? A series of spectacular failures over a lifetime of dealing with things that I didn't like. So whether it be a strong, intense emotional experience, what might be called depression or self-loathing or uh, all the experiences that most of us would be familiar with, and discovering that when I don't want them to be, they become more problematic. That in fact the suffering that I experience is an arising from my resistance to what is. There is no problem within what I might call depression or within an intense emotional experience. There is no problem inherent in the manner that someone might communicate to me or dare to keep me waiting 30 seconds at the customer service desk. There is no problem in death. Death is an idea in my mind. There is no problem in having a brain tumor. There are certain inconveniences such as having a seizure. It's very um, uncomfortable for those around you. I'm unconscious, so there's no problem. <laughs> but, <laughs> The problem is entirely contained within my perception of what is present. And thus, if I change my perception of what is present, the problem disappears. So with considerable uh, opportunity to practice over the years, uh, looking at how my reaction to events transforms not just my experience of the events, but understanding the inner and outer are one, the events themselves. When the brain tumor diagnosis came, there was a deep feeling of perfection unfolding, and there was an excitement. How fascinating, how incredibly interesting, and what possible gifts and opportunities are there here? If I stub my toe, there is an opportunity for psycho-spiritual growth. I can disconnect the ah, to a ooh, interesting sensation. Suddenly stubbing my toe is not a painful experience. And from there, there was a, a sense that with a diagnosis of a, a brain tumor, there's a, an escalated sense of opportunity and gift. And when we seek opportunity and gift, when we invite opportunity and gift, we're presented with opportunity and gift. And that's how the experience has unfolded over the last two and a half years. So how can we move that? 
Mm -hmm. I, I am going in and out again. But how, ca how can we move that in the, through the perceived in and out with the planet? That attitude, it's a wonderful attitude. What does that mean with our responsibility of looking after the planet? Do we have a responsibility? That's kind of, you're nodding there, Elizabeth. Well, it's interesting because I find that the current time on the planet is a fascinating time. <laughs> and, and clearly it's a major crisis time. I mean, we, ha we have more crises than anybody ever could have dreamed up all at once at the same time. And, and I feel like um, I'm here as a volunteer for, for this. I wasn't looking for a, a comfortable time on the planet when I came. And, and it's the way you frame things. Now, there's, there's nothing like Western science for putting you to sleep. We're talking about waking up here. And it puts you to sleep because it has a very narrow perspective. And it only what they can measure with human-made machines is real. And uh, then you, you, know, you, you, don't, you make up models of the universe in these highly intellectual consciousnesses, and then you leave the consciousness that made the models out of the model, as Schrodinger, the physicist, pointed out way back in the 40s and 50s. And, and, but, uh, and, and there's no emotion allowed in science. We're value-free, we're emotion-free. This is cold reason logic. And, so, and you know, each of these things is constrains you more and more and more about what kind of a world you're in. And then you go to the doctor and he takes a picture and he says, <gasps> got a brain tuber. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're going to cut it out. We're going to slash, burn, and poison it, just like the forests on the planet, you know. They weren't quite uh, that excited. <laughs> right? They weren't quite that They weren't excited. quite that excited. <laughs> that was pretty much the... Well, the drug the companies, were, oh, we're going to sell a lot of chemo Absolutely. here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Will's hair was I, radically deforested. <laughs> Did they deforest you? Um, and and the, I mean, this is, it's bizarre when you wake up, you know, when you see the, the whole picture and you're non-resistant to the picture and you say, ah, oh, yes, it's human drama. Isn't it interesting how it's playing out? The planet is going to save itself fine. She's done hot ages before. She's done, does, does ice ages, does hot ages and stuff like that. Comes along this obstreperous little species that thinks it knows better than, than mama nature. And, uh, you know, and, and it's starting to give her a fever. Uh, you know, it's loading her up with all this carbon in the atmosphere and stuff like that. And I remember sitting around with Jim Lovelock in the 80s, and he said, pray for an ice age. We're due for one, and it'll be easier on us than a hot age. And, but it looks like we're tipping the balance, you know, in, in, into the hot age. So what do we do about that? Oh, let's make big sheets of plastic and coat the poles with them to reflect the thing on. <laughs> you know, let's uh, uh, cover the oceans with iron filings that will reflect it off. Well, that killed the plankton, and the chemtrails kill the soil microbes when the particles fall down. And the, the <laughs> it just doesn't work. Our technology is not as smart as what nature does. It's not in communion with itself. Uh, and, it, and it's quick fixes that, that don't work. So we should be talking about adaptation at this point because we've pushed her past the tipping point, and okay, she's going to go into a hot age. She's done it before, knows how. Now the Gulf Stream pump is sinking, so Europe is getting, I always said, we're going to have a mini ice age briefly on the way because of the melted ice. The atmosphere is loaded now with moisture. It has to come down. Northern Europe has had a couple of years of of really nasty, stormy, wet winters. And now it's come down as far as the Mediterranean, where I live, uh, so that our May has been more like March. So I, I watch the seasons changing. Nobody wants to adapt. No, you know, it's either everybody's in denial. Uh, the oil companies, speaking of oil companies, have enough reserves right now to fry the planet five times over. If, and, and, and all they're talking about is leveling off. Um, what, what, what's wrong with solar energy and wind and waves and all these things? I you just know? want to take your words, yeah. stormy, wet winters. Yeah. Because so many people tell me their lives... Is no hot age. Stormy, wet winters inside. It's interesting, again, what uh. happens on the perceived outside. So many people feel that their lives don't work. Mm -hmm. I can make a suggestion yeah. on those lines as well. It's... Uh, noticeable in my inner experience over the years and communicating with others that we have a, a, a collective inner crisis in our 
our society, I mean Western culture especially, which tends to manifest as self-loathing. It manifests as a hypercriticality. It manifests as a, a judgment and a hatred of mm. self, which I have discovered in conversation to be the common experience. It's not an extreme phenomenon. And I would ask, is it a coincidence that at a time where, and this, is, you can, this can be researched through the data within mental health, at a time when individual selves are in a process of hating themselves, suicide rates have been rising in a number of countries and so on, is it any coincidence that we're witnessing a destruction of the planet on the outside as well, a similar disregard? I would suggest that there are no coincidences and there's a clear link. So the sacred activism starts with bringing love into this experience and the more of us that do that, the more the outer and the collective changes as well. Especially as we know, um, we are 80 to 90 percent of water and water carries information and is hating ourselves. You know, as we are connected with everything, with all the water on the planet and in the cosmos, this information of hate Absolutely. is everywhere. And neurocardiology tells us that right now, each of us, even just with the current measurement capacity, we have apparently an eight-foot electromagnetic uh, energy field around us. All this sort of new age stuff is now being shown to be mm -hmm. scientifically verifiable. And the quality of this field is affected by the emotions that I'm experiencing. And of course, we, we know this from experience. Mm -hmm. When someone enters the room and there's anger and there's a, a strongly separate self that's suffering, we feel it. And equally, when there's presence, when there's peace, when there's love, we feel it. And what more do we need? We change our inner experience. And in a very literal, immediate, scientifically verifiable way, we change the physical world around us. Well, I, yeah, I think, I think Will's nailing it in terms of then uh, responding to what Elizabeth said in terms of how you res So it may be true that the planet will be fine, but there's an enormous amount of suffering happening in lots of different populations and in lots of different species. So how do you meet that suffering? How do you address that? Well, that's where, where what Will just said really nails it to me, that you, you do what's in it for you to do but you do it by, um, while radiating that quality it, as much as you can of, ex of acceptance. And this is the classic thing that's misunderstood when people often accuse people in, in the spiritual world of a kind of indifference because there's this quality of, um, of having to allow how things are. And they say that that leads to indifference or it leads to uh, a quality of just a narcissistic going off into your own thing. But this is where the Gita, you know, talks about like not being attached to the fruit of your actions. That you, when you get out of your own way, when you get out of that needing to control how the experience is going to be, you actually find that um, you can make room for a deeper kind of acting, a, a more, a, a purer intention in some way. And actually you're more efficient in how you act because you're less uh, invested in how it out, in, in those outcomes. So this is what's so valuable, I think, about, about helping people find a practice, is they, they can bring that quality to wherever they are in their lives. And that's the answer to what to do. What to do is just do what you can do based on where you are and based on your circumstance, based on the relationships that you have, the, the existing influence that you have. You know, you just try to radiate out to the best you can those, the quality of presence and, and, and the right action hopefully will arise. And the more you do that, the more motivated you get to potentially work on other problems. Um, and so I, I also see another, I, I see an opportunity in sort of spiritual circles where there's a lot of attention on what is my practice going to be? What is my inner practice going to be? But yet you don't see the same kind of attention on what is my outer practice going to be? Like why can't we have sort of teachers that help you focus on, okay, what, is your, what are you really good at? What's your passion? What are you, where's your creativity lie? Well, then helping people kind of direct their uh, external actions as much as we're direct, trying to help people direct their internal actions. Like that also is a practice. And it can be, you can have, you can imagine something like activation workshops where you, a bunch of people, you know, you get together with your team of like spiritual experts and you connect with, and here's your group of people you're going to work with and you help them connect their creativity and their energy to a cause that really, that they really feel. But using all those kind of spiritual principles of equanimity and non-attachment that, and, and caring that we're talking about. So I, I, have, a, I have a question. 
to all of you in so far as there's a lot of talk, not necessarily here, but a lot of, there's a lot of talk about going with the flow and seeing where life is taking you and how, and I, you know, there is waves, I was talking earlier, there is, there is somehow a wave that, or there are waves that kind of go through every level of our existence from the, from the formless to the form. And yet, I know for myself that certain things need to change. This is personal. I need to change certain things inside, perceived outside. And like, so I meditate. And meditation, I love, but it's also very hard sometimes. But I sit with it. So it's not necessarily going with the flow. I have a commitment. I sit because it's something I really want to do, but it's difficult. And I see the same on the, on the outside with the planet, we have to make difficult decisions and it's that we have to have courage, we have to be brave. There has to be heroes out there making decisions that are difficult and unpopular. And so this is where the flow somehow gets complicated. I think you understand what I'm saying, Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm in a drama club right now and I, and I love it because um, I like to encourage people to see this human drama as a drama on a stage. It has a plot. It's going somewhere. Even if it's improv theater, which it is, <laughs> uh, you can, you can when, when you're watching the villain in a drama, you don't say, oh, I hate that guy. You say, what a great actor he is, right? You, you don't waste your time judging him as a person. You're saying the role he's playing is vital to what's going on. This wouldn't be a good show if everybody was just sitting there, you know, chanting Om or something, uh, you know, <laughs> working on the inside. This is real. <laughs> and I said the other day, I, a few of the speakers here I've heard talk about what's real and what's not. This, this world isn't real. I, I think Cosmic Mind would, would be a little offended about that. Uh, that the things it was congealing within itself weren't considered real by its own creation, things it thought <laughs> up, you know. <laughs> it's all real. It's all, <laughs> if it's experience, it's real. That's all, tickle, all real is, right? Tickle the person so, that says it isn't real. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, suddenly there's a reality so, and a reaction. Right. <laughs> so you, you want to know what the plot is because you're in the play. And if you don't have a clue what's going on, then how can you play a, a, an intelligent and meaningful and loving role in the play? So it's very important for us to discern without judging what the drama is that we're making up as we go here and how to, how to act in it. Mm. And then you act in it with love and, and doors open. Mm. Right? Do you guys know the uh, uh, teacher Bernie Glassman, the Zen teacher? Yeah. He has a great uh, kind of yeah. three-part thing that he says to do in any situation. He says the first step is don't know. So not knowing. Like not, don't pretend you know what's going on in the situation. Don't pretend you know what's best for this person, for this particular dilemma. Don't just go in with a, with a, a real quality of humility. And so that's the first step. And the second step is bear witness. So that's just steep in the atmosphere of what's going on. Again, don't contract around your idea of a solution. Just, just percolate. Check it out you know, see what's happening. And then he says the third piece is then the loving action will arise. Mm. That when you really make it, when you're there in that, in that stillness and really, but also really paying attention, using your, all your, your creativity, your intelligence to notice what's going on, then he says that, that find the right action, you know, and you have to sort of trust that that, and that's the tricky part, you know. You'll be attracted. You, yeah. you, you have inclinations, you have talents, you have like, you'll be, oh, there's music over there, you know, let me go on that part of the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, or, hey, they're painting over there, whatever. You know, if, you, if you're non-resistant and you are on the stage, you don't want to just stumble around forever, right? Mm. <laughs> Seizure around, if you will. You will. It will arise because because you have. Uh, f there is magnetic flow in you and attractions and things like that. And I don't think anybody should be trying to change in the world in a way that they don't enjoy doing, mm. because that won't attract anyone else to what they're doing. You know, it won't, won't work. Yes. And it points to or your question points to a paradox, uh, which I think you really nicely answered there, Jeff, or through Bernie's model, which is that we speak of surrender or acceptance, or going with the flow, and it implies a passivity. 
It implies that I'm just going to sit there for eternity and watch my karma unfold, which is perfectly fine if that's what floats your boat. But for me, the surrender, the bearing witness, and I like this first stage of just confessing, I have absolutely no idea what's going on here. You know, really, no clue. Not knowing. Not I don't know, but not knowing. This is extraordinary. What a wonderful mystery. From that, surrendering to what is. So a diagnosis of a brain tumor. So there's the possibility of imminent death. There's the possibility of a debilitating process leading to that. We can apply it to the, micro, uh, the macrocosm of our current environmental circumstance and the other long list of crises that we're experiencing. Surrendering to it, accepting it. But from there comes the action. From that surrender comes the inspired response. And I think, and this is probably very dangerous territory to stray into, um, but from what I've heard with the quantum physicists around this conference, one could at least poeticize, we could at least offer the metaphor that the surrendering, the accepting, is the collapsing of the wave function, perhaps. There's a, then there is potential existent, and there can emerge the new level of thinking that Einstein pointed to, the action that will actually change what we are facing. So there is a paradox, as ever it is just apparent. Surrender and acceptance are the first step towards inspired action, rather than being contradictory to it, I would suggest. Something you were saying about, Elizabeth, uh, about it's important you enjoy doing what you're doing on the outside. Now, again, that raises a question for me, because we basically, I say we, I'm speaking as the human race, not necessarily individually, but or partly individually as well. We want things to get better the way they're going for us somehow. We want more. We all, as a race, still want more. And yet, and more, and we see that as something quantifiable more money to buy more things, but we can't get that. So for a lot of people, the perception of the change that maybe has to come is less. They're going to have less. And that is the major stumbling block, as I see it, for getting somehow a different attitude. Well, the, the big problem is that, again, going back to, I, I love science. I am a scientist. I'll always be a scientist, and, and I think uh, uh, we need it. But science can, can be wrong or partially right about things, and we're stuck with a Darwinian theory that as, as if it were all of evolution, that uh, it, to me it's the youthful phase for a species when it has to expand and it, it multiplies, it grabs all the resources it can to do it and it elbows other species out of the way. That's the youthful mode where you, it establishes itself. But there comes a point when it gets too expensive to bump off your enemies and it, and it becomes cheaper to feed them, okay? <laughs> And this is the growing up point for a species is, is when it begins to cooperate with others and solve problems among themselves and save all that enormous amount of money that we spend on the military, you know, just to, to build up uh, other countries, to love each other, <laughs> to, to contribute to each other, and then use our creativity collectively. And uh, so, so we're seeing an odd picture here where we're told... Physics is telling us the universe is deteriorating by entropy. Uh, biology is saying life is an uphill struggle called negentropy. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the bleakest creation story I've ever heard. And so we're stuck in that model of we got to get what we can while we can. And, and your typical CEO knows how bad things are, but he's saying, give me one more fix before it all falls apart, you know, because <laughs> he doesn't know there's a growing up phase. And, and even the bacteria without benefit of brain who had the planet to themselves for half of evolution figured out how to solve the crises they caused, which are the same crises we cause, global hunger, global pollution, stuff like that. If they could do it, plus build us as giant taxis to get around in safely, as Lewis Thomas once said. 
said, uh, you know, we should be able to do these things too. But, but, we, but we're stuck in a model, in a creation story that says get what you can physically, stuff, while you can. Okay, mm -hmm. thank God we've got Annie Leonard and people like that who now tell us the story of stuff online and we can figure out that's not the be all and end all of everything. <laughs> So what do we want to grow? We can't grow this physical economy anymore, but we can certainly grow love and grow uh, non-resistance and grow awareness and grow our, the light as we wake up. And the only way to, to dispel darkness is just by turning on light, not by going with swords after the darkness. So we need to invite people to be the heroes of the next phase. We live by stories. We, we're all, we are on a hero's journey. Heroes and sheroes, right? But some of the old archetypes we may not want to keep. You know, are we, do we need to be dragon slayers or can we turn them into Puff? <laughs> puff the magic <laughs> dragon, right? <laughs> can we make friends instead of enemies? So if they had a complete picture of evolution, they would see there's a growth phase and then there's the sustainable part where you flower instead of just getting bigger. What about us in adolescence if we kept growing? Well, you know, it wouldn't it, work very it, well, it would makes it? Me, when you're saying it, it makes me think that, <laughs> I mean, there is a kind of classic trajectory uh, in, in the mature practitioner, which is that the, the longer, when you hear this all the time, uh, speaking to practitioners and meditators, the longer they practice, the more s the more simple things get in some ways, the more self-sufficient they get, the less they feel that they actually really, really need. So there is, it, it's perfectly commensurate with this, if indeed we need to divest ourselves of, of all the things that we think we need, then I think a, a practice can really help with that. I mean, that, the, the two seem to work in alignment. Um, oh, I mean, periodically so. in my life I've given, I just did a clothing giveaway and it was so fun to go to a party and see all the other women wearing my clothes because I, <laughs> I don't get to see them when they're on me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were all saying, we're all wearing Elizabeth's clothes. <laughs> all your clothes? <laughs> no, obviously <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you it, you accumulate, and and right. then you need to do these. What did the indigenous people call them? The the giveaways, yeah, because the potlatch. they the potlatch, yeah. because having too much stuff en encumbers you. So yes. there's no reason why we can't do elegant simplicity, and there's no shortage of energy. The planet's been running just on solar for four billion years. Uh, you know. This, this example you used <laughs> of the, the potlash is a really interesting uh, case in point. You started to speak in it about the, the story we have going that uh, I need to have more and to, if I have to make sacrifices to help the environment, this is bad, it's not good for me, so therefore I'm not going to do it. And yet cultures have existed within the same biology, within the same selfish genes and so on, where <laughs> if you were the cool dude, if you were the guy, you didn't drive a big car, you gave away more yeah. than the other guy. Yeah. So we can just tell a new story. We can actually point out exactly. the beauty of giving. I've worked in fundraising for over a decade. And for me, I facilitate an opportunity for someone to feel great about themselves by serving someone else who they've obviously perceived to be separate from themselves initially. So as we tell it, so again, this, this juncture of the inner and the outer, as our stories become clearer and updated, supported by various realms of scientific inquiry, and we discover that to have less is to have more, that to serve is to have, to give is indeed to receive, then there's not a challenge, there's not a difficulty, but there's an opportunity. But you have to experience it to know that that's true. Sure. That's the thing. It's when you start to actually do that, when you start to live by that principle of giving is getting, mm -hmm. then you get that feedback loop. You, feel, you see what it's like to do that, to make someone happy in that way, and it's like it becomes a much bigger motivation than, than making money. Mm -hmm. But if you don't put yourself in that position, you'll never know. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. It's like, so you need to help set, set up people for opportunities to, to, to give back. Sure. Uh, because it's like th you're in these sort of feedback loops in the culture that pull you away from it because it's in its own sort of individualized spiral. So you've got to hack the system, man. <laughs> so how do we start? <laughs> I mean... We, we start yeah. w the only place and time that we can start, of course, which is here and now. And we're in an extraordinary position at this conference to be amongst people with open minds, curious minds, and open hearts. But every interaction we have, every moment, is a precious gift, is an opportunity to bring forth our highest ideals and our intentions, to meet 
separation and anger with loving presence. To see the guy busking that does a song that moves you and to give 20 bucks rather than a bit of small change and to, and to show your joy and to make it bloody clear that giving is great fun. To give, to serve, to love. The more we do this and the more we show, I mean, because it is great fun, the more people pick up on this, the more they work out that maybe working you know, 80 hours a week to get a bigger car isn't actually the way that I'm going to find happiness as increasingly we discover more clearly. Basically, I think we just start living the future that we want now. We're all capable of treating other people the way we want people to treat each other in the future. We can all eat food that we want people to eat in the future. <laughs> you know, we can treat, just, just do it, start living it. That's how it comes about. Totally. I mean, I would say the one thing I would add <laughs> to it is, no, what Will me. mentioned as well is, also bring in the sense of the playful. You know, it doesn't have to be like eating your vegetables. Like, there's this kind of dour vibe that you get all the time. <laughs> I mean, you should eat your vegetables. You know. But, I mean, you can make it playful. You make you can them make sound it... like nasties. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's not talk about vegetables. I like vegetables. But anyway, you can make the whole thing fun. It doesn't have to be so earnest. It doesn't have to be exactly. so, like, you know, heavy. <laughs> like, oh, man. Like, it's just, just bring, you can bring some levity to it. It's not know. deprivation. Right. Levity is the antidote to gravity. <laughs> <laughs> well said in an excellent accent. Okay. I'm being told we need to finish. Our allotted time has, uh, has expired in the uh, realm of uh, space and time. So I'd like to thank you all very much. You all made a very significant contribution, and I think it was a very lively and worthwhile discussion. Thank you. It was great thank to be with you guys. This yes, was fun. Yeah. This was fun. Yeah. And thank you, we Renata. We want everybody to enjoy life. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for watching Conscious TV. I should thank the audience as well, because they were part of it in their own way. So thank you, everyone, for watching. And uh, I hope, as always, we see you again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.